Thank you for inviting me. My talk for the day is biofilms in spine infection. Let's start with an example. Here is a 55 year old diabetic woman who got a straightforward T lift at L5S1 for spondylolisthesis. She developed a serious wound infection and in spite of repeated wound debridements and VAC therapy, she had osteomyelitis and progressive implant loosening. In an unstable situation like this with persistent infection, there is no other option but to reinsert the implants and attempt infection control. Spine is unique in this aspect. You cannot use an external fixator like you can do for tibial osteomyelitis. Primary surgeries with implants anyway have a higher risk for surgical side infection. Some have reported that with instrumentation, the risk of infection increases up to 28 fold. And among many other factors, one of the main reasons for this is the predilection of bacteria to colonize the surface of metals. Louis Pasteur said, the germ is nothing. It is the terrain or the environment in which it grows that is everything. Implants provide an avascular, stable and inert surface for the bacteria to form biofilm. So what is a biofilm? Biofilm is an assemblage of microbes that is irreversibly associated with a surface. Means they can't be removed by gentle rinsing because they are encased in a matrix of primarily polysaccharide material. Here it is important to know the difference between planktonic and biofilm bacteria. Planktonic or free living bacteria are freely suspended cells described on the basis of their growth characteristics in nutrient culture rich medium. This is not the natural state in which bacteria live. Actually the natural state is for the bacteria to form biofilms as a survival mechanism. In this mode they exhibit a distinct phenotype by altering the gene expression and becoming dormant, making them more likely to survive in a hostile environment. The biofilm life cycle is crucial to understand what goes on on the implant surface. In step 1 there is a reversible attachment of free bacteria to the implant and it starts a few seconds and extends approximately 2 hours of exposure. In stage 2, the attachment becomes irreversible as they anchor themselves permanently using pili and cell to cell adhesion, thus forming a micro colony. The bacteria are surrounded by the self produced extracellular sugary material or slime and in early stages this biofilm is relatively unstable and susceptible to eradication. Next, the bacteria in the biofilm multiply and the biofilm grows in thickness and size. Stage 4 is maturation which is characterized by a phenotype change in the bacteria. In response to the environment, they alter gene expression and go in a low metabolic mode and lose their pili and flagellae. By this stage, they become more resistant to eradication. The fifth and the final stage is dispersion. As the biofilm breaks, some bacteria switch back to planktonic phase and then become free to colonize other surfaces and bone. There is a so called race to the surface between bacteria and host cells. If host cells such as fibroblasts arrive at the biomaterial surface and establish secure bonds, bacteria are confronted with a living integrated cellular surface. This acts as a defense mechanism. However, some bacteria like Staph aureus unfortunately have surface adhesion proteins that can attach to collagen and host cells and are still able to establish a biofilm in spite of host cells reaching first. Once biofilm is formed, bacteria are a thousand times less susceptible to antibiotics. When there is no biofilm, free bacteria can be attacked by antibiotics, antibodies and phagocytes. But when a biofilm is formed, the antibiotic and antibodies cannot diffuse into the biofilm and bacteria now can exchange genes with each other that are responsible for development of antibiotic resistance. In addition, the bacteria now are in reduced metabolic stage and are less susceptible to antibiotics as antibiotics can effectively target functions of bacteria only if they are rapidly multiplying. Frustrated phagocytes dump their enzymes which cause surrounding tissue damage and thus expose more surface for the biofilm to propagate. All organisms can form biofilms, however the most common ones encountered in orthopedic infections are the most notorious. Even mycobacteria can form biofilms, however they do so to a very limited extent and hence implants in the presence of mycobacteria usually don't give problems. The implant material also determines susceptibility, tantalum is the least susceptible and titanium has lesser tendency than stainless steel. Another factor is roughness. 
more the roughness of the implant surface the more suitable it is for biofilm formation the bacteria can colonize the irregularities and topographic niches on the implant surface the diagnosis of biofilm infections can be challenging peri implant tissue samples for culture have low sensitivity as there are only few planktonic bacteria floating around hence it is recommended to take 5 to 6 culture samples they also have low specificity as there can be wound contaminants and the growth may not be representative of the biofilm flora implant biofilm cultures are not easy because of the removal of bacteria from surfaces injures and kills them they need a resuscitation step and that step is vortexing and sonication implants are collected in ringer lactate solution in a sterile container then a vortex machine is used to shake them up then an ultrasound bath is used to dislodge the bacteria without killing them and finally a centrifuge is used to concentrate the bacteria they can now be identified using culture or pcr this study from mayo clinic actually found that this method has higher sensitivity than tissue cultures coming to management the main issue is whether implant removal is required to control infection and the major decision making factor for this is time whether the infection is acute where biofilm formation is not so extensive or permanent or whether the infection is delayed where the biofilm formation is more likely to be extensive in acute period the implants are required to maintain the stability of the spine whereas in delayed presentations the priority is to eradicate the infection especially if fusion has already been achieved in adults with acute infection the literature supports incision and drainage and closure over drain aim is to retain the implants because implants are required for the stability of the spine whether it is done for trauma or for spondylolisthesis if multiple debridements are anticipated then vac reduces the number of trips to or and this has been shown to successfully help in retaining the implants here is where adults differ from pediatric patients as we will see in the next slides treatment strategy does not change depending on acute or delayed presentation of infection philosophy is to retain implants as long as you can until you are sure of fusion during these debridements the surgeon may have to do an implant exchange and put fresh implants if there is a concern of biofilm formation some have even tried removing the implants and soaking them in 10% betadine for 30 minutes or even autoclaving them before reimplanting them overall the aim is to try to retain implants until fusion for persistent infection with demonstrable fusion the obvious choice would be to remove implants so that the biofilm burden is lessened whether you should remove an infected t leaf cage is more controversial some cage materials have more tendency to form biofilms peak is hydrophobic and fares worse compared to titanium in this regard so if there is a displaced infection and there are loose implants and a cage it is better to remove the cage if the implants are secure but it is a delayed presentation more than one month then an irreversible biofilm has already been established especially if it's a peak cage in those cases it's better to remove the cage if acute less than one month then one can try to salvage without removing the cage in pediatric scoliosis surgeries for chronic infections the success of infection control is very poor if implants are retained many other papers have advocated removal of implants for successful clearance of chronic infection the spine is not unstable at least in patients where there is no three column osteotomy however the deformity can progress and it depends at what time the implants were removed whether before or after successful fusion therefore this may require reimplantation at a later date acute infections three out of four times the implants can be retained so the recommendation is to try to retain implants or to do an implant exchange or reduce biofilm burden longer duration of antibiotics are necessary if implants remain in situ in the future we may get implants that resist biofilm formation currently research is ongoing for various coating technologies like antibiotic or antiseptic based coatings and even with nanoparticles some show promise however this is still under development so to conclude implant related infections are hard to eradicate biofilm bacteria are difficult to eliminate with antibiotics and debridements alone they are also difficult to culture and require special techniques duration of infection has a bearing on the persistence of infection delayed infections have robust biofilms and frequently require implant removal whereas acute infections can potentially be salvaged with early debridements thank you very much